So we're ready for the second session. Thank you for returning or for joining us. I'm Derek Penslar. I'll be chairing this session on war experiences in Jewish identity during the Second World War with two speakers. Our first speaker is Dr. Galit Haddad, who will be speaking on the French Jewish prisoner of war experience in German captivity. What I like about both of these papers, they, they deal with aspects of soldiering or fighting during the Second World War that are not typical. That is, most of the literature is either on Jews as fighters, Jews as victims, and these are uh, really papers about uh, Jews in a somewhat different or liminal state, for example, that of being a prisoner of war, as Iris Rachaminov pointed out in her pioneering book about World War I. I mean, the prisoner of war experience is such an important component of soldiering in modern history, and it's something that's received relatively little attention. And uh, Dr. Haddad's paper will focus on World War II. Dr. Haddad is a scholar of contemporary French history, focusing on military, social, and cultural history uh, during the two world wars. A graduate of Tel Aviv University, Dr. Haddad currently serves as a researcher in the Goldstein Gorin Diaspora Research Center at Tel Aviv University, and she is also a research associate in the School of Advanced Studies in the Social Sciences in uh, Paris, the Ecole des Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales. Uh, also a member of the Scientific Committee of the International Research Center uh, of the uh, Historie de la Grande Guerre in Peron, in France. Her book entitled 1914, oh, sorry, it should be, it should be 1914-1918, Ce qui uh, was published in 2012 by Les Belles Traditions in uh, Paris. And then our second speaker, uh, Françoise uh, uh, Ouzan, Dr. Uh, Ouzan, will be speaking on homesickness and belonging Jewish GIs during World War II. Oh, we were just talking during the break about how fascinating this subject is about nostalgia and homesickness identified as a disease already in the time of the French Revolution um, and with fascinating work that's been done on this but I don't know of anyone who's worked on this for the Second World War. Uh, people have worked on it for much earlier periods um, in literature, history, and psychology so I'm very much looking forward to this paper. Um, uh, Dr. Ozan is a former associate professor at the University of Rheims a senior research associate at the Goldstein Gorin Diaspora Research Center and a Spiegel Research Fellow at Bar Ilan University. She's authored or co authored several books in French and in English on the Holocaust, the post war period, and on American Jewry. She's also a contributor to the Jerusalem Report. Um, we all know that journalists, unlike most scholars, know how to write. Her latest book, entitled How Young Holocaust Survivors Rebuilt Their Lives, was published by Indiana University Press. And she is now completing a book, or the book is forthcoming, on American Jewish service members during uh, World War II. So this is going to be, I think, a very interesting panel, and I invite Dr. Haddad to begin. Thank you very much, uh, 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 Derek Pensler. Um, in the next 30 minutes or so, I will discuss the experience of French uh, prisoners of war uh, of Jewish descent in German captivity during the Second World War. Uh, this is, in fact, the subject of my current uh, manuscript, which also covers the, the role of uh, Vichy regime collaboration in the fate of Jewish prisoners of war. However, since the aim of uh, today's conference is to understand the specificity of the experience of Jewish prisoners of war from below and through the, uh, the lens uh, of, of the social, social actors themselves uh, in relation to their identity, I've chosen to highlight the experience of POWs of Jewish origin by a selection of case studies which together represent the multifaceted uh, captivity experience of the French Jewish prisoners of war who fell into German hands while uh, fighting for France. I will focus on how the Kames anti-Semitic practices, racial uh, discrimination de facto, reshaped their sense of belonging and identity. In September 1939, as all mobilized French citizens, Jews were called up to defend their homeland. Some 60,000 Jewish combatants were rapidly enlisted to the French army. Uh, in June 1940, however, the Battle of France ended in a bitter fiasco. In a few weeks, the French army collapsed. Uh, 1,800,000 French soldiers were taken prisoners and eventually transferred to POW camps in Germany. 
Uh, among those uh, prisoners of war, it is estimated that 10 to 50,000 were of Jewish descent. Despite their Jewishness, they were granted a relatively protected status behind the barbed wire and were repatriated uh, to France at the end of the war, while their co-religionists in France were deported uh, to concentration and extermination camps. The Jewish uh, PO ex POW experience thus carries a surprising dimension as all Jewish prisoners of war remained paradoxically safe while subject to German captivity. Until recently, the experience of Jewish prisoners of war uh, of Jewish army uh, was by and large over overlooked in Holocaust studies and the historiography of uh, WW2 captivity. Uh, for historians and the public turned their main and belated attention to the categories of uh, uh, camp survivors and hidden Jews. Uh, in words of French Jewish philosopher and former Poe uh, Emmanuel Levinas, I quote, in the drama that European Judaism has just experienced, Israelite prisoners of war did not hold the first role. They did not go through the death camps. Their fate was just everyone's plight. In order to provide a panoramic overview of the Jewish uh, prisoners of war experience, I've chosen to adopt these three key angles, uh, which when taken together, reveal the extremely distinctive character of the French Jewish POW experience. First, the capture itself as a critical turning point, religious identity or racial origin, French prisoners of war or Jewish prisoners of war. Second, racial discrimination and brutality committed by the German camp authorities. And third, Jewishness in captivity, uh, the community experience, experience uh, religious practice, and the challenge of embracing one's origin. So let me, let me begin uh, with my first point, taking captive as a turning point. Uh, the German po policy thought all prisoners of war at the moment of their capture was dictated not by prisoners origin or religious faith, but rather by the national uniform they wore at the phase of uh, surrender. Wearing a French uh, uh, uniform thus protected the Jews from potential ar arbitrary measures that could have end in tragic scenario. Uh, the same approach was applied to Jewish uh, 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 of, uh, of the foreign uh, legionnaires. Uh, who were considered as French soldiers, regardless of their nationality. From this point of view, the Jewish uh, POW experience stood in a harsh contrast uh, uh, to the grim fate of Jewish from the, rank, uh, from the ranks of the Soviet army, who were rapidly executed. Uh, in fact, since the Soviet Union did not sign the Geneva Conventions, the German had no diplomatic interest to uphold the Soviet uh, soldiers' right, uh, human rights. However, wearing a French uniform alone did not provide any guarantee of protection, as illustrated by the tragic case of African combatants of French army who were met with merciless massacres by the German soldiers after the France's defeat. Once they reached uh, uh, um, uh, to the POW camps in Germany, Few weeks after their captivity, all captures combatants grappled with a long process of registration, uh, in the course of which they were granted a new military status uh, as they officially ceased to be combatants to become prisoners of war. All of them uh, were categorized according to their nationality. The only additional distinction um, uh, was um, the only this, this, the addition, additional distinction was according to their military rank. Uh, troop soldiers were held in regular camps called Stalag, while officers were kept in different camps known as Afla. This distinction based on uh, military rank was the only one authorized by the Geneva Convention, Article 20. 
Any other distinction, race, religion, ethnicity, was considered discrimination and violation of the convention. In practice, however, the situation was quite different as racial ideology has taken root in the barbed wire environment. The POW camp became a form of microchasm reflecting the racial Nazi system. The mass of men had to undergo the matriculation procedure in which each prisoner was given captivity papers. The captivity record um, included the POW fingerprints, portrait and family status, etc. But then alongside the official details, uh, an unexpected detail was required, religion or race. And at this point exactly, that the Jewish, that the issue of the Jewish origins uh, popped up. At this stage, they realized that their multidimensional belonging, patriotic, social, or military, was whipped out and replaced by an exclusionary racial affiliation. Suddenly, Jewish prisoners of war were no longer French prisoners, but Jewish prisoners. In Emmanuel Levinas' own words, in captivity, the Jewish prisoner suddenly rediscovers his Jewish identity. The German did not conduct uh, a deep uh, uh, inquiry into the ancestry of uh, POWs sus suspected of having Jewish blood in their veins. Uh, the only way to track uh, uh, Jews among the French uh, POWs, except for those who have, a, uh, who have uh, a Jewish or Hebrew sounding name, was therefore through their self-declaration census. This registration process allowed the Germans authority to classify all Jewish prisoners of war who declared their origin. And of course, atheists or converts uh, were registered as Jews if they, has, uh, if they had uh, Jewish sounding names like Blum, Wey, uh, or Dreyfus. Some Jewish prisoners of war who considered themselves as atheists, they felt being forced to adopt suddenly other religion as Raymond Lipa, who under the pressure of his friends declared himself as Catholic. I became, as he put it, a Catholic against my will. Take the example of Jean-Louis Crémieux, who was only 23 years old when he, take, uh, when he was taken prisoner. In his interrogation, he responded, free thinker of Jewish descent. But it was the German interrogator who decided to reformulate his, uh, the identity of this young and naive Jewish officer, um, which is why he was not declared Jews and a Jew, and I quote, the, interrog the interrogating uh, officer said to me half-heartedly, I won't write that. I asked him why. He whispered, I know what I know. And what do you know? I'm German from Poland, he answered, and I saw what I saw. Well, just tried free thinker. And he wrote, without religion. Unlike those who managed to keep their identity underground, POWs with Jewish sounding names had no alternative but to endorse their origins. For Rabbi Simon Fuchs, uh, who was mobilized as rabbi and medical personnel, his Jewishness was an undeniable part of his identity. As he explained, as soon as we arrived at the camp, we were given a card on which we had to indicate our identity. There was, of course, a spot reserved, reserved for race. It goes without saying that I put Jew on it, whether one believes in the existence of a Jewish race or not. Fox is the only one who declared himself Jewish. His co-religionists, who initially assumed their identity, were finally listed as Catholics. So how could this happen? Let me read a few lines uh, of this extraordinary, extraordinary scene when the declaration remains silent as described by Rabbi Fuchs. We had to present ourselves to an old German lieutenant who took our identity. At a certain point, Major Khan appeared. The question was asked, religion? Silent from the questioned person. Then I heard the German lieutenant say, I'll mark you Catholic. I immediately instructed all Jewish officers to remain silent when they, when they inquired about their religion. 
And so all of them, some of them were called Levi, I mean all of them were registered as Catholics. Except for me, of course, since as a rabbi, I had, I had to affirm my Judaism. And that is why, when it was my turn, I declared Israeli military chaplain. There was no way out for this brave German lieutenant who wrote uh, Jewish chaplain, and I thought I saw in his eyes a look of pity. We also know uh, that French commanders have been asked to prepare sometimes a list of Jewish prisoners of war. However, denunciation uh, uh, of Jewish brother in arms and compatriot were few, uh, were few and uh, far between. Uh, French officers remained loyal to the French army's esprit du corps and often refused to provide such a list as requested by the German authorities, or they simply mentioned uh, Catholics. Uh, the, uh, there are only Frenchmen among us, declared Captain Marie in Edelberg Auflag. They have all served under the same flag and in the same uniform, regardless of their faith or nationality. Some Jewish prisoners were terrified uh, at the thought of being physically examined and therefore identified as a Jew. The circumcised body as one of the sites of otherness was a clear mark of, the, of a person's Jewish origin. However, as noted by Jewish officer Roger Ico of the Pomeranian camp, the German authorities did not carry out, carry out uh, uh, systematic physical control of Jewish prisoners. As uh, one can observe from these different testimonies, this registration pr uh, procedure imposed, willingly or not, a deep reflection on one's origin uh, as the came's racialized context did not leave much room for the denial, denial of one's identity. This was also the case of Jewish prisoners of war who could dissimulate their origin. Uh, and somehow uh, it, it put it somehow put them on the backs uh, to the wall of their origin in the racialized, co racialized context of the Nazi prisoners of war camp. Uh, uh, there, there was no place to deny uh, their origin. Uh, that was, in fact, the initial phase which marks the entering into captivity. And from this point forward begins the POW camps experience. And uh, the next question of this paper is how German authorities treated the Jewish prisoners of war of Jewish descent. The treatment of Jewish prisoners um, by the guard was different from uh, one came to another. Yet, on the all Jewish prisoners of war were subject, subject to various extra discriminatory measures compared with their other with with other prisoners. Uh, when I, when I say the camp authorities, I mean the German guards and not to the official uh, Reich authorities. Uh, the contacts between sentinels and prisoners are one of the different social interaction which shaped the social landscape of the camp. In most camps, Jewish uh, uh, POWs were put in a separate barracks, especially designed for them, and in few rare cases, they were required to set a yellow badge on their uniforms. Uh, in some stalag, uh, Jewish uh, POWs were exposed to harsher living conditions than their compatriots, including painful, painful labor, arbitrary punishments, and mistreatments by the German guards, as documented by Lefebvre Edmond. And I quote in his own words, because of their origin, the guards never hesitate uh, to insult the Jewish prisoners. Uh, and we often had to ask the camp officials to interfere in case of insults and various abuses, such as punching, slapping, kicking, etc., for the most ridiculous reasons. In some stalag, the minority of the Jewish prisoners of war suffered more than other, in other camps, such as the one of Baum, Baumholder, where, uh, as the famous writer Francis Ambrier testified, 
The guards parked them aside and denied them the consolation of being treated despite the uniforms as French soldiers. A former Jewish officer at Koldis Auflag and then at Lubeck Auflag, Robert Christophe, uh, describes uh, the camp's brutal environment, uh, a quote, uh, in Baumholder came, the instruction went as far as barbarism. When the rain turned the ground into mud, the guards amused themselves by forcing their captives to do relaxation exercise, which were more painful because they had to be executed at full speed with command, when commanded to do so. Flats on your stomach, stand up, down on your stomach, crawl, pass under the electric wires. Uh, if one of the victims of this boars leaned on his hands and toes to avoid falling into the mud, a postern guard uh, would jump on his back uh, or his buttocks to push him in despite himself. In this quarter of punished, the guards easily drew the gun, using no excuse. They would shoot a captive without being reproached by the German officers. Most of the abuse uh, acts were the result of personal initiative by the Sentinels. According to the international conventions, guards were not allowed to resort to violence or humiliation. And yet, as showed by a wide range of prisoners' testimonies, the guards sought to satisfy their domination thirst and even display, displayed pleasure uh, at inflicting and seeing suffering among their victims uh, who were disgraced by their race. The German guards, indoctrinated by Nazi ideology, followed the spirit of the Reich politic. Their mental landscape was, uh, was deeply shaped by Nazi rash, uh, rash, racial indoctrination, which served as fertile ground to the enacting of this ideology. In the camp's dynamic, the guards have, the guards have their own autonomy, as Christopher Browning uh, demonstrates in a different context. Um, he demonstrates in his work, Ordinary Men, uh, they were easily pushed into violence measures due to the impact of the barbed wire, wire brutal environment. It should be emphasized that despite of these physical and psychological abuses, Jewish prisoners of war have not been exposed to a systematic or extreme level of violence by the German guards. Uh, there was a border that the German army did not cross, and uh, the acts of violence that uh, uh, definitely they, they occurred, but they remained controlled and channeled. Uh, as pointed by Fr uh, French historian Henry Rousseau, Germany did not approach racial politics in the same way on its Western and Oriental front with the war in France. Uh, the battles against the Slavs carrying different racial war agendas. Regarding the social interaction in captivity, the one which particularly marked the small community of Jewish prisoners of war was not surprisingly uh, the one between them. And uh, now I will move to the third and final section of this paper, Jewishness in captivity. The camp uh, soon became a new uh, provisional home, a new family. The prisoners of war sought to create a sense of normality by various activities, such as studies, sport, and entertainment. And here, religion also played a significant role. Many prisoners of war uh, who had previously abandoned religious uh, uh, practice returned uh, uh, to spirituality. The spiritual life was a source of hope and support to cope with the daily life in the camps. Despite the segregation of Jewish prisoners of, wars, uh, of war uh, from their non-Jewish uh, companions in the camp, at times they found comfort in the being together in the same barracks. It, wa it was as if seg uh, the, the exclusion had led to uh, the formation of a small community bonded by hardship and distinguished by its race. 
The experience of captivity was a factor that encouraged many POWs to get closer to religion, regardless of their faith. It was a way to cope with the uncertainty and, uh, and to keep uh, moral. As Levinas put it, and I quote, uh, in contrast to those who were deported, prisoners were given full-time access to fall into meditation. This is where the spiritual experience began. Uh, those who had never learned a single letter of Hebrew since their bar mitzvah began to question their own roots during the captivity. Some attempted to go even further. They were pushed to their Jewishness. The Bible, Hebrew, and Jewish history all seemed fascinating and worthwhile of study. In, in the camps where was a rabbi, uh, he took the initiative of building bridges among the Jewish prisoners of war community. The rabbi held religious services, uh, uh, Shabbat, Jewish holidays, or Torah lectures. For him, it was also an opportunity to practice his rabbinical vocation, as Ernest Guggenheim himself admitted and was named the Stalag rabbi. Uh, and I quote, such a community may have been a remarkable, if not ideal, field of experience uh, for its rabbi. The rabbi was exactly one of them, a prisoner li like them, a number like them. Uh, he was up, it was up to him to fulfill Hillel's wonderful motto in a place where there in a place where there are no men, strive to be a man. The rabbi had his mission, as he explained. Above all, he had to show that in this double galut, uh, this double exile, God had not left us, that we were still men of the Torah. This Torah, which does not stop in the front of the barracks gates or the barbed wire of the stalag. Each holiday provided an opportunity for those Jewish captives who were separated from their families to proudly affirm their Judaism by heads held high. Uh, while the feast of Yom Kippur is an intimate one, the Jewish Passover Seder was a social celebration involved the entire camp community. And it's easy to understand why those men sitting close together were moved by the resonance of the Jewish Passover story from slavery to freedom. And I quote, every, participa every participant, uh, whether a Christ, pastor, Jew, or like Christian, was invi invited to recite a verse from the Haggadah. Therefore, the setter was held in a tight mental fellowship. We all thought of the end of our captivity by referring to the exile from Egypt. The respect, sometimes the respect for Shabbat and Jewish ritual was a kind of uh, uh, spiritual resistance. Uh, this tenacity of the small Jewish prisoners of war community moved Pierre Dreyfus Schmidt, former mayor uh, of Belfort, uh, who described the extreme anti Semitism that flourished in the Front Stalag. 140, where Jews were forced to wear distinctive mark to identify their race. This didn't stop the most devout among us, the majority of whom were Alsatian and deeply religious, from holding a religious service in one of the rooms on Friday evening and Saturday morning. Liturgical hymns could be heard passing through the doors and windows of the room uh, uh, where they were saying. To clearly show the German that wearing an armband had no impact on the men's faith and that, was, and that it was ineffective method of intimidation. And uh, before, before concluding, I, I, I also want to point out that these Jewish prisoners of war uh, have not only faced their captivity and racial exclusion discrimination, but much worse. Uh, fear for their families uh, under Nazi occupation and Vichy regime. 
they were all uh, aware of the of the new regulation adopted by Vichy and uh, the exclusionary practices imposed on the French uh, Jewish population, such as the Yellow Star, the laws of on the Jewish status and uh, the arrest of their relatives and eventually of their wives and children. The echoes of the genocide made uh, their way into the closed uh, world of the games. The signals were there, just like the letters that were returned with the mention, destin the destination, uh, unknown destination. Uh, to conclude, I will say that within the Nazi machinery, machinery of genocide uh, on European soil, the story of the Jewish prisoners of war represents a kind of enclave in Nazi racial politics. For these few thousand Jewish prisoners of war, it was their French soldier or officer status that served as a shield, as fragile as it may have been, against the logic of racial policy, while 76,000 of their co-religionists in France were being sent to death and the mass extermination games. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Haddad, for that very moving as well as erudite presentation. We'll now move on to Dr. Francoise Ouzan for her presentation, after which we'll have discussion. Um, I will start by saying that it is indeed my pleasure to thank the team of the Goldstein Goren Diaspora Research Center at Tel Aviv University for taking care of this organization, um, uh, this virtual, virtual workshop. Um, my gratitude goes to Professor Ronnie Stauber, the head of our center, and Simcha Goldin, the previous head, who uh, heartily welcomed the idea of our workshop on Jewish soldiers during the two world wars. I wish to thank in particular Sarah Appel and Adi Mos Moskowitz, who made it technically pos possible. Uh, now I'll start. Um, uh, there are parallels between uh, Galit's presentation, who focused on Jewish identity among POWs in France, and mine, uh, as far as Jewish identity is concerned, you will discover them. So over half a million Jewish men and women enlisted or were drafted after the Japanese launched a surprise attack on Pearl Harbor on December the 7th, 1941. While many volunteered and others were drafted, most servicemen were unprepared to cope with hurried basic training and weeks of transport to countries far away. Now, like all GIs, they felt homesick, but this feeling was aggravated by anti-Jewish hostility. Oftentimes, these young Jewish men had left their Jewish neighborhoods and families for the first time. While most of them coped with prejudice, harassment, and even exclusion on account of their being Jews, they fought for acceptance and wished to distinguish themselves as American patriots, just what we saw also with World War I uh, for French and American Jews. I will not elaborate on the various ways with which soldiers, sailors, Marines, airmen, medics, nurses, and doctors responded to the anti-Semitic attitudes of Americans who thought that Jews were simply not part of the American ethos. I delved into this topic in, I hope, a forthcoming publication. I propose to discuss here how some servicemen coped with homesickness and what antidotes they found against what was once considered a lethal disease called nostalgia. So my choice of this subject stems from reading that during the American Civil War, nostalgia, first considered a psychological disorder, was regarded as a condition of homesickness. Statistics recorded in a volume entitled Medical and Surgical History of the War of Rebellion in 1888 identified 
more than 5,000 cases of nostalgia developed to a morbid degree, I quote, I quote, which resulted in, that is striking, 58 deaths of such diagnosed death. So the first occurrence of the term nostalgia was found in a medical dissertation written in 1688 by Johannes Hofer, a Swiss medical student. Hofer's work is detailed in a history of nostalgia published in 2007 by a French psychiatrist, André Bolzinger, through whom I actually discovered the subject. He showed that during World War I, the distress the soldiers felt in trenches, also called fox holes by the soldiers themselves, triggered homesickness. Later, Susan Matt, an American scholar, explored homesickness as, I quote, an American history. She found a few occurrences of the term nostalgia during World War II in articles published in War Medicine. Therefore, a few questions arise regarding how service members coped with this emotion during World War II. So I will ask um, more particularly, in what circumstances can we trace expressions of homesickness in testimonies of Jewish men in the military? What antidotes to homesickness could they find in a military framework? How did their efforts result in a feeling of belonging, both to a Jewish minority and to the American military? So I'll first examine the concerns of the War Department about both homesickness and the morale of the troops, an important issue. So um, an issue of a monthly digest published by the War Department in May 1944 came up with a way to present the soldiers, I quote, tendency to brood um, in several ways. So um, it can be um, the, the solution proposed by the War Department, by, by the, researcher, the researchers at the War Department, can be summed up in one sentence. Keep them busy, don't let them sit and brood. Expressions of homesickness could occur in various subtle ways when military personnel encountered overt anti Semitism or simply when army meals triggered, triggered a cultural shock for observant Jews who were minorities. A talk by psychologists and published also in 19, um, 1944 in War Medicine um, helped American troops understand why they were homesick. <laughs> it showed that brooding was detrimental to the morale of the troops. Psychiatrists pointed out that memories of home, of a wife, a girlfriend, and a mother were the prominent triggers of homesickness. Consequently, in the military, GIs were told to control their emotions and be, I quote, tough. And they were also encouraged to write letters home now, among the bundle of letters addressed to Ali Flat, a social worker at the Jewish Community Center of Wilmington, Delaware, this undated letter stands out. It is written like a poem. I will read the second and third stanzas. Uh, so this is my slide. Um, yeah. Uh, so I will uh, start with um, the second stanza. Now the war, the war has disrupt, disrupted our living. Like each one, I'm doing my part. But I must confess from the outset that it is done with tears in my heart. Oh, the lives that are needlessly taken and the blood that's so wastefully shed 
small wonder my heart's overflowing at conditions this wartime has bred. So uh, what I will say is that because this officer, he's actually an officer, uh, um, Lieutenant Lipstein, because this officer sees the goal of the war as the victory for freedom, he can transfigure his emotional distress since emotional distress obviously doesn't go with the ethics of American masculinity. Psychologists doing research for the War Department considered that servicemen should be kept busy. I just mentioned it. And this is illustrated in a soldier's letter to the same social worker in Delaware. I quote, I have to take inventory of every item in my ship stores that really keeps me busy. And also working on the figures and books takes a little time, but it's not too bad. Many thanks for the Y Recorder. Now, the Y Recorder is the Jewish community paper in Delaware. It was also a remarkable uh, boost, uh, moral boosting uh, reading for um, GIs. Another type of uh, psychological boosting is provided by, um, or was provided by a charitable corporation, the United Service Organization um, that worked in partnership with the War Department since February 1941 to boost um, the morale of the troops. Um, it, it's it's symboli symbolized by three uh, letters, USO, and it supplied movies and live entertainment and even a quiet place to write letters. It comprised six organizations among which the National Jewish Welfare Board, and this has been mentioned before by my, Michael Mainberg, the, the, the YMCA, um, which was an organization very uh, charitable indeed. Now, another GI from Delaware writing from Berlin in October 1945 explained the positive effects of the shows of the United Service Organization on the soldiers' morale. In um, another letter, I quote, yesterday, he wrote, a USO show finally caught up with us. Believe me, it was marvelous. It was only a small show of six, but it really did the trick. Now, um, in an interview, a former infantryman from the Bronx related another kind of experience, and this is my next slide. Uh, after being shipped overseas, he landed in Marseille, France, and became part of the famous 402nd Rainbow Infantry Division. He then crossed the Rhine River and remained in Germany and was stuck in a foxhole, a tren uh, the trenches we talked about previously, during the winter of 1945. And this is how he coped with homesickness. He wrote letters regularly, and on Friday night, although he was not an observant Jew, he reconnected himself to his mother and the Jewish faith while bombs were falling. So I'll uh, read the second part of this slide you actually see now. My mother, she used to sell me wine. Now, it was illegal to send wine. So she went to the doctor and got a medicine bottle for cough medicine. And she'd take the cough medicine, spill it out and put in the wine and mail it to me. And also mail me a salami. And she made me a candle. She told me to light the Sabbath candle because she always lit the Sabbath candle. So I kept this in my granite bag. I just knew the initial blessing. But if you light a fire, you can get killed. 
one of my friends got killed that way. So what I did, what I did was I dug in, took a C-ration can, put the candle in there, put it like two feet in and lit the candle. I took my salami and I had my Sabbath meal. So you can see that praying and religious rites could therefore be an antidote to homesickness, even for someone who is not observant. Interestingly, uh, he noted that there was no atheists in folks halls. Now, towards the end of the war, homesickness was even more acute. In May 1945, Chaplain Jacob Kraft of, of Wilmington, Delaware, uh, had a busy schedule since chaplains could be called on to serve all faith. Yet, he wrote every day to his wife, Leah, except on Saturday. Hundreds of his letters have been collected in a volume edited by his wife, along with a historian, Tony Young. Now in war-torn it, war Italy, towards the end of May, he confessed to his wife that he was, I quote, in a deep nostalgic mood that lingered for a few days. And he also wrote further on, there is not a day, not an hour, nor a moment that my thoughts don't revert to home. Now, in a letter to his wife, Cha Chaplain Kraft enclosed a copy of a letter he wrote to the president of his congregation in Delaware to inform him about the services he conducted in southern Italy. And that is the slide you actually see on, your, on the screen. Um, here is part of Christ's letter, again, for lack, because of the lack of time, I will only uh, read the second part. When we chanted the prayers and hymns on, of the Sabbath service, forgotten were the discomforts and the surroundings of the moment, the beauty of the Sabbath queen and the nobility of the great faith transformed both the motley congregation and the improvised synagogue. A glorious tradition, a rich religious and cultural heritage, a common language and liturgy united us all. So it united the concentration camp survivors who were there, the American soldier, the Australian soldiers, everyone, American soldiers, everyone who were there, who was there, and even an Italian sailor. So now let's turn to another effort to help soldiers cope with homesickness, the Armed Services Editions books. And this will be my next slide. When men crossed the channel before D-Day, they threw unnecessary weight away when wading waist high in the water. Yet, they rarely discarded these small lightweight paperbacks called ASE books. The outstanding efforts of the Council on Books in wartime to print these paperbacks were coupled with the determination of Raymond Troutman, a 34-year-old reserve lieutenant, probably Jewish. He was chief of the library section of the United States Army. Their joint endeavor led to the printing of, it's quite incredible, 120 million armed service editions and 1,200 different titles. So this uh, enterprise allowed thousands of boys raised during the depression to read books they could not afford otherwise. And I'm drawing on this point from the inspiring research by Molly Gaptil Manning on the subject. Now, slide, the next slide, as you can see on your screen, shows the cover of a pocket-sized edition 
um, I think we, we need the previous one. Uh, we need um, we need the previous, uh, yes. It's the story uh, of, uh, Gershin, Gersh, um, of uh, George Gershwin. Uh, so this apparently must have been a cathartic experience to read it. Um, and David Uwin, the author of this book, was a Jewish GI who served then overseas in the armed forces. He confessed that he knew only too well what a solace, I quote, books could be, especially during the long hours before and after combat. So books could be as enjoyable as a good letter from home. And these pocket-sized books were often dropped by parachutes over far from countries of the Pacific. And, um, and they were meant to comfort men in combat zones and boost their morale. So the Army and Navy did not distribute portable paperbacks to service women who remained in non-combat positions. They were rather given female-oriented magazines such as Good Housekeeping. Now, um, my next slide will show another title, The Education of Hyman Kaplan, um, I could not find the, uh, the picture or even the, the actual uh, army, um, army uh, armed service services edition. I think it must uh, have been completely destroyed. Anyway, if someone can uh, send me a picture of it, I'll be very happy because I looked for a long time. So it's a collection of humorous stories about a Jewish immigrant who prepares himself for the responsibility of citizenship and irritates his classmates. Leonard Ross is the pseudonym of Leo Rosten, a famous American writer who introduced the American audience to the, Jew to the Yiddish vocabulary and a wealth of, Jew of Jewish cultural connotations. Leo Rosten received numerous moving letters from servicemen. And the author recalled one that was etched in his mind 40 years later. I'll read it. I want to thank you profoundly for myself and more important for the men here in this forsaken part of the globe. Last week, we received your book on Mr. Kaplan as an experiment. I read it one night at the campfire. The men hold. I have not heard such laughs in months. Now they demand I only read one Kaplan story a night, a ration on pleasure. I read or I read the stories with an accent. I hope you would approve. Obviously, the accent alluded to was Yiddish. Leo Rosten, who was born in Poland, once said that humor, I quote, teaches us how to cope with conflict. So it may have been of great help. Now, aside from reading books, singing together was one of the best moral uh, boosting activity. And this leads me to my third point, singing together and belonging. And the next slide shows the cover of the booklet entitled Selected Jewish Songs for Members of the Army Forces. Now, a V, uh, you can see a V, which is a visible sign of the patriotism of Jews in the military. We mentioned that issue um, before in our symposium with uh, World War I. And here again, World War II was in a opportunity for Jews to show their patriotism and, uh, and reach um, a better integration. Interestingly, as far as songs are concerned, one must know that during World War I, playing Home Sweet Home was forbidden. But during World War II, Jews in the army had a few opportunities to sing together as testified by the existence of this booklet published in 1943 
by the National Jewish Welfare Board. It includes patriotic hymns in English, such as uh, the Spangled Banner and obviously all the uh, uh, all, all the um, Hebrew songs we know for Shabbos and and uh, all the other um, high uh, and all the high holidays, including including of course uh, uplifting Passover songs like Elia Wanavi in Hebrew and in English Go Down Moses. Now the next slide shows a Passover Seder. And again, if you uh, look very closely at the picture, there is a V icon made of matzah that can be seen behind Rabbi Philip Goodman, who is second from the right. And it is again an expression of the strong patriotism of Jewish Americans, of course. And it is significant that high ranking officials, officers that like General Mark Clark, commander of the US, um, um, which army was it? Um, yeah, commander of the US Fifth Army, uh, used Passover as a, met a metaphor adapted to the advance of the Allies on the road to victory. He addressed Jewish soldiers attending a Seder in Naples, Italy in April, 1944 in this way. And this is shown, shown in the next slide. Uh, I'm reading from the next slide. Tonight, you are eating unleavened bread just as your forebears ate unleavened bread. Because the exodus came so quickly, the door had no time to rise. There was a time of unleavened bread in this war, the time when it looked as though we might not have time to rise, time to raise an army and equip it, time to stop the armed rush of a Germany that was already risen. But, the bread has begun to rise. It started at Alamein. It was rising higher when the Fifth Army invaded Italy. It is reaching the top of the pan. And soon, the time will come when it spreads out and into a finished, a finished product. Therefore, um, this is beautiful. I think it's a beautiful rendering uh, of uh, the symmetry between Passover and, and, and the near victory. And, um, therefore, the military seders that took place all over the, war, the world in the year 1944 showed Jewish service members the congruence between American goals and American Jewish values. Once Jewish servicemen recognized the signs of homesickness, this negative emotion, it was sometimes called like this, could be transformed into a driving force to gain full acceptance in the American military. And this, despite anti-Jewish attitudes. Some fellow GIs still thought Jews had horns that reappeared at night. This is to tell you how ingrained uh, uh, Jews who were pictured in, in the Bible as the synagogue of Satan uh, were um, perceived in the American mind then. So some soldiers concealed their Jewishness, but others thought that the best strategy to be accepted was to affirm it strongly. For combat soldiers, airmen, and sailors, a strong feeling of belonging to their unit or their crews was essential. And esprit de corps, as the French expression goes, was even a matter of life and death. I have thus tried to demonstrate that 
homesickness and belonging to the military to opposite war experiences were in some ways reconciled. Traditionally, a family experience, Passover turned out to be a public celebration during World War II, thanks to the legitimacy given by the American military to Judaism. Historian Deborah Dashmore argued that, I quote, ironically, under army auspices, Jews achieved a group cohesiveness they never had as civilians. And interestingly enough, I, in some letters, I have found a few instances when um, Jewish GIs uh, used the initials M-O-T, which stood for members of the tribe. Now it connoted an ethnic group, not only a religious group. So um, we may say that for religious and non-religious Jews, this wartime bond assumed the form of a new awareness of Jewish peoplehood. Thank you for your attention and I welcome your remarks and questions. Thank you again for another illuminating but also very, um, uh, very touching presentation. Um, what I think I'd like to do is just offer a couple of comments and then I don't want to waste, I, I don't want to take away time from discussion. So I'm going to make a few comments based on my reaction to the pep papers. I'd like to then go directly to um, Q&A from um, everyone who's, who's uh, out there. And then, you know, if in time the, um, uh, the, the, the speakers have time to respond to my comments, great, but I'd like to just sort of get a few things out there to get the discussion going. So I have to just move my screen a little bit and get to the notes I was taking uh, while you were speaking. These are great, great papers. My first questions are for uh, Dr. Haddad. One is if you could just say a little bit more about something that you may have assumed that we knew, which is about why Germans just don't, you know, kill the Jews off right away or anyone they perceive as Jewish in a POW camp. You mentioned viewing Western European Jews differently, but that doesn't really explain much given what happened to Dutch Jews or what happened to so many French Jews. I mean, the element of the Geneva Conventions comes in, but I'd like you to maybe talk a bit more about that. Perhaps the fear that the allies would, you know, kill German POWs if the Germans did the same. What role was played by the Red Cross? Did the Red Cross visit um, these camps? Did they have any particular concern about the Jews? Uh, so just sort of, if you could explain that a little bit more. And then I'm wondering about, you mentioned Jews who you know, were sort of forced to declare themselves as Jewish or confront their Jewishness and also those who were able to, uh, or were encouraged to classify themselves otherwise, say as Catholic. And I'm wondering if we have any rec records of people, how they felt about that. I mean, do you feel guilt? survivor guilt, for example, you know, you've, or just this, I mean, this broader situation of Jews who, who go into hiding at various sorts during the war, hiding their identity as Jews, and then what psychological consequences there, there are for that. And I, a third final question has to do with the difference between um, Jews in the Stalag and Jews in the Oflag, that is the French Jewish officers who really represent the pinnacle of French identity, of pride in the nation, and of suffering both as being French and suffering maybe privately or quietly for being Jewish. If maybe talk a little bit about if, if you've seen anything particularly about the case of the of, of officers. Um, anyway, great paper. And then also for, for Dr. Uzan, um, this brings out so many interesting questions about emotion. One has to do with the iconic status of the war letter that you referred to quite a bit. Now during the war, so far as I know, morale officers did not discourage such correspondence. In fact, they encouraged it. They thought it was necessary for morale for the soldiers to have a sense of what they are fighting for, right? They're fighting for their, it's very gendered. They're fighting for their daughters, their girlfriends, their mothers, you know, it's a very old gender discourse. But on the other hand, the need not to keep, the need to keep homesickness from overwhelming the soldier as you talked about through alternative means. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about balancing that because the letter home was actually a very important morale mechanism. Another general question has to do with links between nostalgia or homesickness and other forms of what were called in modern history, including World War II in the United States, war sickness. So dating back to, let's say, 
Russian military psychiatry of the 19th century, which as Jan Plomper wrote, was largely concerned with fear, pathological fear, but also, also homesickness. U.S. military psychiatry during the war, there was a whole, that whole cottage industry of U.S. military psychology with a tremendous concern about fear and how to combat fear in war, uh, battle fatigue, which is not quite the same thing, and homesickness. So fear, battle fatigue, previously known as shell shock, later known as post-traumatic stress disorder, and homesickness, I'm wondering if they're all considered comorbidities and interrelated, and if then they're going to be treated through a common cognitive approach. Um, and now last to Jews, uh, the nexus between the, the American soldier and the Jewish soldier. As you mentioned briefly at the end, but I think it's worth really emphasizing, the research done during the Second World War in the U.S. military emphasized small group solidarity as the greatest obstacle to psychiatric breakdown and for the maintaining of morale, and I assume fighting homesickness, and that the Jewish soldier then needs to be thought of as someone who has to be integrated. It's not just whether they were or weren't, but also they have to be integrated with non-Jewish soldiers, no matter how much emotional connection they may derive from hanging out with other Jews or singing Jewish songs um, or, or, or the like. It's really this issue of integration with the non-Jewish soldier is perhaps the most important thing because black soldiers during World War II were in segregated units, but had among the highest rates of psychiatric breakdown. And this is pointed out in the, in the multi-volume study, The American Soldier, which has a separate chapter on, quote, the Negro soldier, end quote. It doesn't have a chapter on the Jewish soldier or any other minority, but you know, there's a particular problem. So this question of integrating the Jews with non-Jews as being in fact even more important than you know, the issue of Jews finding solidarity or comfort with, um, with other Jews. Anyway, those are just some of my preliminary comments on these two great papers, and now I'd like to open it up for questions. Uh, please feel free to either um, use the chat feature or to just, um, is it the, the raise hand feature? Is that what you wanna use? Or just use the raise hand feature. Either one is fine. So the chat things that I see are from the previous panel, it looks like. That's all about World War One. So questions? Well, while people are thinking of questions, maybe I can ask then the, uh, the um, uh, panelists to respond to my own questions. So we'll start with uh, Galit and then move on to, uh, uh, to Simcha. Okay. Unmute yourself, Galit, please. Désactivez le coupeur de son. It's okay. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Derek Pensler, for, for your questions. And um, you are right, I didn't uh, uh, raise the issue of uh, the Red Cross, uh, um, the diplomatic issues, since uh, 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 I, didn't I didn't have enough time. That it's 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 a uh, it's lake, lake of time i only i i, I spoke only about the exp the camps experience um regarding the 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 red cross so the red cross he knew uh, about those uh, abuse he knew about uh, those uh, humiliation um but uh, actually in all the reports uh, we find uh, only few lines uh, uh, that indicate the Jewish were separated from their fellows uh, um, to another uh, separate barracks, or the Jewish uh, were forced to put a, a yellow badge on their uh, uniform. And uh, there isn't really uh, uh, um, a reaction. We can say even that uh, the Red Cross was relatively silent. Um, the, on, the only thing that uh, uh, we can say that the, the, the Red Cross uh, usually defined those acts like, um, like, like abuse, but not uh, abuse from uh, racial uh, 
uh, reasons, uh, not from um, uh, the point of view um, uh, of racial ideology, etc. It's more um, uh, the, Red, the Red Cross call it violation of the spirit of the Geneva Convention. And, um, and even when the Jewish Congress uh, in 1944 uh, uh, um, in, in address the, the, the Red Cross because there was really uh, um, uh, a danger for the Jewish uh, uh, prison for, uh, from Jewish descent. Uh, uh, the Red Cross, even then, uh, uh, he said that the Jewish are relatively treated exactly like their friends. There is no, uh, uh, there is no difference. Uh, only there, there is uh, uh, all those abuse. It's only in the initiative of the responsible, uh, the guards in the uh, in the camps. Now, regarding the the, the diplomatic issue. Um, you are right to, to ask it because um, uh, thus far the, the assumption was, was that the German uh, respect, if we can use this term, uh, uh, the Geneva Convention, uh, that in this respect was the main reason why French Jewish prisoners of war escaped execution. Uh, yet, this is only a partial explanation and, uh, and uh, in my book, my criticism, it's exactly this, uh, um, uh, this argument, because if the Geneva Convention certainly served as a formal basis uh, for the policy towards prisoners of war, there was in fact no guarantee that they would respect uh, the international laws in, in the long run. And, um, and uh, in the case of the American and the British allies, Germany had in turn um, a keen interest in conserving the, the principle of uh, uh, diplomatic reciprocity as the allies retain German prisoners of war in their respective territories. Uh, while, while there was no uh, no soldiers, no, no captives, no German captives, in in uh, in France, so uh, it's totally different uh, uh, situation, and the case of France was totally different also because uh, following the defeat, uh, we, sh we should recall that following the defeat of uh, 1940, France chose to lay down uh, its arms and uh, engage negotiation with. Uh, um, uh, the government uh, of Vichy and uh, in the framework of this uh, um, uh, agreement the issue of uh, prisoners of war was one of the uh, was one of the most uh, important uh, subject and uh, France became the rest actually uh, rep France replaced the United States position as uh, the, um, um, the, the responsible of uh, 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 the protective power, uh, the responsible for the uh, French prisoners of war, and um, and the relationship was dif it was different, um, and. And the third question, uh, the guilt. Yes, there was a guilt. They, I found in the testimonies uh, some Jewish prisoners of war uh, um, who describe their feelings uh, uh, um, not, not, uh, not why they kept. It's more testimonies of, uh, uh, of Jewish prisoners of war who um, um, who describe why they didn't uh, uh, dissimulate their identity, although they could do that. Uh, they didn't have a, a sounding name, a Jewish sounding name. Uh, they were assimilated French. They could do it, but they they, they didn't do this. Uh, um, 
and the reason was the the, the solid the solidarity uh, with their co-religionists. And uh, finally, there was a big difference between Selig and Oflak, of course. Uh, the life was easier in the in the Oflak when where there were all the all the, the officers, since they didn't have to work also. And uh, uh, so, but there is something that I should mention here. Uh, Oflag it's for, 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 for the officer for the officers, as I said. And uh, all the Jewish prisoners of war officers were at a certain moment in 1941 uh, were gathered and they were sent to uh, disciplinary camps in called it. Uh, um, they were gathered uh, together and then they moved to Lubeck. And um, it wasn't actually, it wasn't, uh, um, they, they, they weren't separate from their uh, uh, compatriots. They only, they, they were in those uh, disciplinary camps, um, just uh, in a different barracks, but they, but but they, uh, they they were part of the social life of the camp. Uh, they have they have relationship with the others prisoners of war. But it was uh, considered as disciplinary uh, uh, camps. I hope that I answered all the questions. That's fantastic. Thank you, uh, Dr. Zong. You have to unmute yourself, please. Yes. Uh, thank you for your questions and especially your remarks. Um, for those who don't know, I must say that you have uh, written um, a fascinating um, book about entitled Jews and the Military, which is a historical revaluation of the Jews' involvement in the military. And so all the questions um, you are actually actually um, asking come from uh, a, a very um, deep place, I guess. And I think I've read that your father also suffered from anti-Semitism, if I'm not wrong. So um, first of all, you mentioned um, fear. Well, uh, as far as the emotions you mentioned, fear. So uh, you are extremely right to mention fear because um, the researchers who worked for the army actually uh, prepared um, a book, well, a collection of, of research articles prepared for the fighting man himself by a committee of the National Research Council and with the collaboration of, of the science service. And this was, of course, an considered as a contribution to the war effort. So obviously fear is very dangerous. It's one, it's one of the most uh, dangerous emotions, most negative emotions. So how to combat fear? So the, the psychologists, the researchers who th thought about it uh, found, at found six ways to uh, no less than six ways to combat fear. First, um, action dispels fear. So you have to do something. And this uh, actually uh, rejoins what I, I was saying. There's a parallel with what I, I said previously. Yeah. Uh, the army wanted them to be busy. Do something uh, because otherwise you're gonna be afraid especially if the period of waiting is too prolonged. And you should be occupied with the preparation for action. Uh, and this is work. Um, when you're expecting uh, combat, um, when you're waiting for enemy bombers to return, you, you should do something. Well, uh, I presented a book as um, a sort of uh, escape from this fear. Uh, the, ASS, the ASE books. Um, now, the second, um, the second uh, reason, also, 
I mean, the second way to fight fear, according to those um, psychologists, is physical contact with friends or comrades, comrades in arm. Um, men should, uh, before a battle, for instance, um, be uh, next to uh, another man, another com comrade, not far off, and even if without any words spoken. So you said before, um, you mentioned uh, Derek Pensa, uh, group solidarity, belonging, and that's why I focused on belonging, belonging to a unit you uh, really felt, and that's why they, are, they were um, in battles, they, there was no anti-Semitism or maybe much less, because you depended on the other body. So uh, that's the, the second uh, uh, solution. So to say that they found physical contact. Um, now, um, they say that uh, the roll call, roll calls plural, help. Because, uh, because when you know that your, uh, your bodies are alive, it gives you strength. And this, this is precisely what I found in, um, in those archives in Delaware. Um, the men who were writing to this social worker actually asked what, what is happening with so-and-so. And they were so happy and reassured that he had been distinguished for uh, a flying cross or another honor. And basically that they were alive. So, um, so uh, roll calls help, uh, um, and the the um, fourth uh, way to fight fear, according to research uh, conducted by the War Department, is that knowledge is power over fear. So, in fact, when you're close to a battle. You should use every moment of leisure, so to say, um, to find out what uh, what battle will be, what the battle will be like, what the enemy will be like, and um, and also you should not um, listen to rumor. Rumor is extremely destructive, and um, actually, I found a, a sentence about rumor from those uh, researchers. Is they were psychologists. Rumors thrive on fertile soil. What soil is fertile? A community, a city, or an army moved by common emotions is fertile soil. And war is a circumstance circumstance that produces this state. These men share the hope of victory, the fear of defeat, and hostility against both the enemy and all others who threaten them with failure. So let us home again, um, we're, we're very important because um, actually the boys, that's how they were called, did not want to frighten their family. So they showed themselves stronger and, and also persuaded that they would make it through, um, except some of those who are in POW camps and who uh, could not eat anything and were very feeble. But um, otherwise they, they, they would uh, strengthen themselves by expressing in letters that they were doing good, that um, uh, soon victory will come and, uh, and uh, Jews will be recognized as patriots and their contribution will be emphasized. Uh, now, another way um, that uh, the, um, uh, the, army, the um, army researchers and psychologists, psychologists, uh, psychologists found um, is that fear is contagious when it's expressed in action. Uh, so it has to be control and, uh, and men should be encouraged to, um, 
act as though, I quote, as though they will come, come, even though, of course, they are tortured by fear, even though the opposite is true. Because giving in to fear, as everyone knows, tends to increase it. So it's every um, combat soldier's re responsibility to control the signs of fear. And if I can just interrupt for a second, what I'm getting at is everything you've mentioned so far as a remedy against fear is also a remedy against homesickness. Yes. That, that's the point I'm getting, making is that I, I, that's why I'm asking to what extent the psychiatrists themselves are aware of the concept of comorbidity. They, they may not use the term, but the concept that fear and homesickness are related. Things like rumors, rumors that your girlfriend has been unfaithful to you, right? right. You, you see this also in the war literature. Don't believe the rumors. Be busy, be with your group. Uh, and, and, and that the approach is a CBT. Again, I don't know if they're using the term CBT, but there was a cognitive behavioral therapeutic commonality behind the response to homesickness and the response to fear and the notion that you need to be as you said integrated into your unit as a whole as opposed to retreating into a kind of sub-ethnic identity which i know is very important for jews in world war ii uh, but remember that the vast majority of psychiatric breakdowns in world war ii did not happen overseas 60 almost two-thirds of them happened in the united states they did not happen overseas. They happened, you know, in training camps or they happened, you know. So I just think that homesickness is part of a larger picture of military psychiatric illness that may or may not have used the term comorbidity, but it's worth thinking through. Oh, by the way, the term member of the tribe is very common among American Jews in the 21st century. And I remember hearing it even when I was a child. And the question is where it comes from. I don't know if it started being used in World War II or if it was used before, but that would be very interesting to look into. Um, maybe the term originated in the war. I don't have a clue, but it's very what I, yeah. what I can tell you about a MOT member of the tribe is that um, Chaplain Sachs, who was in uh, Okinawa in 1946-47, uh, I think, um, had a newsletter and, um, and uh, I, I think he titled a few paragraphs like MOT, member of the tribes. Otherwise, I have read, uh, I have read this in only a few letters, I mean, this um, mm. MOT um, issue, but I know now it's very common, but um, there's a chance that uh, Chaplain Sachs <laughs> has had an effect. Um, I don't really, um, no. Now, as far as what you said, battle fatigue, shell shock, PTSD, all these comorbidity, um, it's, it's true that there is indeed a change of vocabulary for the same symptoms uh, or similar symptoms. Now, how can you distinguish homesickness from battle fatigue? Um, it's, it's, uh, it's difficult because um, very often, and this was a, more precisely when nostalgia um, was considered an acute disease in, um, in um, the American Civil War, in World War I, in the French trenches, the difficulty for um, medical uh, personnel was to identify because it was not written on their chest that you know they were homesick. On the contrary, they would not eat, they would not express themselves. So when it was acute, there was no such expressions. Uh, probably there was no letters or um, uh, it's, it was very hard to uh, actually diagnose nostalgia because uh, someone uh, struck by nostalgia um, let himself perish. Um, now, um, if we consider shell shock that you mentioned, it was very common. Uh, and also, um, it entailed um, types of behaviors uh, that were, um, that also showed silence as, as a main component. 
uh, and very quickly, I think it evolved um, at the, probably at the end of World War II as uh, PTSD, post-traumatic um, syndrome. Uh, and the uh, last thing you mentioned, the small group solidarity. It's true that I have um, seen in several instances, in several units, and also among POWs in, um, in uh, far away, like in uh, the Philippines, in the POW camp in the Philippines, getting together to uh, sort of celebrate um, Yom Kippur, to respect that day, the Day of Atonement, uh, gave them, as I think Galit mentioned that, a, a spiritual, um, it, it rekindled their flame of Judaism. And uh, it was um, a spiritual incentive maybe to cling on to life. I may that's, have spoken too long. No, but that's what's so fascinating is that that's going to happen once a year. <laughs> Passover happens once <laughs> yeah. a year. And so how we relate these forms of interaction, Jewish soldiers with other Jews, which could be frequent, they could be occasional, and they do have a sustaining, nurturing, you know, nourishing function, with then the interactions with non-Jewish soldiers, which of course could be difficult, but could also be quite warm and, and cordial and collegial, and, and not just collegial, but life-saving, um, and how we reconcile those two in terms of maintaining morale, fighting homesickness, combating fear, because these are all, these don't have pathogens. None of these have pathogens. These are all illnesses that are imputed. And then the diagnosis is made through seeing if people conform to a constructed list of symptoms. So this is all a construction. And then in real life, the Jewish soldiers in World War II and the US forces, to what extent they're deriving sustenance from other Jewish sources, other Jewish soldiers, and to what extent it's from their daily interactions with non-Jews, who are the vast majority of the people they interact with. That's the, the big challenge. Anyway, that's thank you both for your great responses. And we still have time um, for questions. And I know some new people have joined who probably didn't hear the papers. So um, if you have questions, please, either using the raise hand feature or, um, or entering them uh, via the chat, please, please speak up. If there aren't, I think we can maybe take a five minute break and we'll, we'll um, pick up again at 6.30. Uh, would, you like, would you like me to add something about deriving sustenance with non-Jews just before we... I'd, I'd like that. <laughs> um, okay. Um, it's quite interesting and striking to realize that when veterans speak, that is 40, 50 years afterwards, they um, emphasize the fact that um, their best buddies uh, non are non-Jews whom they met and they went to Oklahoma or to, uh, or to far flung uh, states in order to reunite with them and that this friendship has been very strong and uh, built during World War II. Um, so obviously they, they, they want to show um, that uh, they integrated very well in their unit. And that is why uh, they, um, they, they, they actually um, uh, spoke of their bodies in, in such a way. And they kept uh, links, ties, until uh, 40 or 50 um, years later. But I, I think also that um, sustenance with non-Jews has probably been um, sustenance, uh, deriving sustenance with non-Jews or by non-Jews must have also derived from um, non-Jewish chaplains who did their best I mean, a lot of them to, in, to encourage Jews to, um, 
to uh, go to religious services and observe the high holidays. And um, I read some accounts when um, Jewish chaplains themselves recognized that uh, to organize Passover, Christian chaplains had done much more than they had done for their own Easter uh, celebrations. Um, and, and also I found something absolutely, to me, it was almost unbelievable. I read that in folks' holes, um, Jews were fetched by, um, by other GIs uh, to attend, um, let's say, a Passover service that, uh, that was, uh, the case was in Dan, Germany in 1945. That uh, was one of the first services because the high ranking officers thought that it would be good to show that many Jews were there and that it was um, legitimate, uh, Judaism was legitimized as, uh, as a, a religion in the United States and that they were part of that victory. It, was, it took place, I think, in Dan, Germany in 1945. And, um, and, and it's, it's interesting that, you know, GIs went to get other GIs who are Jews at the risk of their own lives while they were deep into their folks' holes so that they could take a truck and um, escape, let's say, the battlefield to go and to attend, to, uh, attend a, a Jewish religious service. Amazing. Up here. Amazing. In their temporary home. Yes. So, which gets us back to homesickness. Okay. <laughs> wow. Thank you both for your great papers and comments. And uh, I now I'll turn it back over to the organizers because I don't know what to do at this point. So again, I think we will take a 10 minutes break. Uh, to, check, to check that the next speakers are uh, ready and we'll meet again at uh, 6.40, okay? Thank you, Derek, Thank you. for your stimulation. Thank you very much. Bye.